Christian, won't you please turn with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 4. We're going to be focusing on verses 1 through 5, but it's actually a two-part sermon. And so the entire text that we're dealing with tonight and, Lord willing, next Sunday night will be Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. I've entitled our message tonight, Seven Essential Habits of the of committed Christians. And allow me to remind us, last week we began by introducing ourselves into the habit of being a faithful and committed Christian. We looked at, to help us get into the right context, the right uh, uh, understanding of Philippians 4, we looked at Philippians 3 and we looked specifically at verses 17 through verse 21. And that's where we learned there was a message there that we got to understand. Are you a friend or are you a foe of the cross of Jesus Christ? And the underlying theme in everything is be committed. Because undoubtedly to be committed you need to understand, first of all, am I a friend of the cross of Christ or am I a foe of the cross of Christ? And I summarize what I mentioned last week, just so you would recall to your minds, to be a friend of the cross is to be a committed Christian, faithfully following the likes of the Apostle Paul and others who walk as he walks. And how did he walk? He followed Christ. And that would be the same. Because a friend of the cross isn't a stumbling block to other believers. And essentially, a friend of the cross isn't a stumbling block to the unsaved. As they commit to following Christ. Following the example of other committed Christians. Like the Apostle Paul, and others like him who walk with the Lord. To be a foe of the cross of Christ is where you are then a stumbling block because of your apathy, because of your lack of commitment to living for Christ, bringing every thought, every word, every action into captivity in Christ. You are a foe when you are apathetic in that, when you are living no better than the world. Because the unsaved will wonder, well, why should I follow the God who you claim to worship and praise? So we dealt with that last week. Now, undoubtedly, I left you a little bit high and dry, because if you were here, you'd be wondering, okay, but what exactly does a committed Christian look like? How does a committed Christian behave? How would the Apostle Paul behave? as he follows Christ and implores others, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, thankfully, we don't have to try and imagine or think up what a committed Christian looks like. We have before us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, seven habits of a committed Christian. Time only permits us to deal with five of them tonight. We will, Lord willing, come back next week and deal with the remaining two. There is a lot to be said about the remaining two in verses uh, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So we're going to just, I'm going to read verses 1 through 9, but then we're going to focus our time tonight on verses 1 through 5. So follow as I read in the scriptures, Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1 through to verse 9. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge you, Odia, and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, 
I will say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any, if any excellence and of anything worthy of praise, oh, dwell on these things. The things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we bow before you this evening and are so thankful now for the time that is ours to come together in the evening hour. We've had a blessed day, Lord. We came in the morning hours and we worshipped you in spirit and truth. And now we've returned in the evening hour. Once again, looking to you, the author and finisher of our faith, waiting on you, which is to be believing in you. And so, Lord, as we now search out these habits of committed Christians, may we truly do an inward inventory. Help us, Lord, to look into the depths of our hearts just as you already have. And as you have plumbed the depths of our heart, Lord, I beg of you, if there be a wicked way within us, create in us a clean heart, restore unto us the joy of your salvation. And so we look forward now to what we will learn and what you will help us to live out in the hours that are yet still to come, in the days yet to come, the weeks, the months, and yes, Lord, if you tarry a while, the years. And we will thank you for your faithfulness and beg of you and pray Help us to be a faithful, committed Christian. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So in the passage I've just read, verses 1 through 9, we find listed for us seven habits of the committed Christian. However, as I said, we've only got time tonight to deal with five of them. We'll come back next week, and Lord willing, we'll deal with the last two habits of a committed Christian. There's just so much to say. And we need to jump right in to the first five habits of a committed Christian. So let's look at the first, and you find the first right up front in verse 1. It is a firmness in commitment. This is a habit that should be in any committed Christian. A firmness in commitment. Look at verse 1 of Philippians chapter 4. Therefore, now remember, whenever you see a therefore, you've got to look back to see what the therefore is there for. Paul has just been telling them, you have a salvation. You are, you are Christ's. You belong to him. Now you need to start walking with him. And you need to know how to do that. So here's what you do. If you're in your baby steps, follow me as I follow Christ. And so he then goes on to say... Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. In other words, have a firmness in commitment to the Lord, my beloved. You see, Paul's just got through in the last part of chapter 3 by imploring the believer in Christ to imitate him and to imitate others who, like him, press on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And it's important that we do so. Why? Remember what we learned last week? Because when we do follow those who are walking with the Lord, and when we do look to our own being committed to the Lord, it will help us from slipping into apathy. It will help us remain absolutely committed to being easily recognized as a friend of the cross of Christ, not a foe 
of the cross of Christ. We will not be a stumbling block if we are a committed Christian to living with the, for the Lord, serving the Lord with that gladness of heart, that singleness of purpose of mind, to glorify Him, to honor Him, to exalt Him for His glory and for the good of whomsoever the Lord sets you down alongside. So practically what Paul begins to do following in verse 1 is he expounds a little bit on what that stand firm in the Lord looks like. But I don't want to hurry on. I want us to look carefully back at verse 1. Because what that commitment looks like, what that every day, what every waking moment looks like for you and I to live committed to Christ, that's actually set up for us in the first part of verse 1. Paul starts his introduction in chapter 4 by describing what these habits are, and he, he uses a few remarks which, if we're not careful, we will miss that they actually speak to our first habit, a firmness in commitment. Let me explain. You see, Christians, believers in Christ, who are pressing on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, are those who have a firm commitment. And so when Paul describes the Philippian church as my joy, and my crown, look there in verse 1, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, the believers in Christ living in Philippi, the born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, these are my joy and my crown. You are my joy and crown, says Paul to the Philippian church. And what exactly does he mean when he says, Believer living in Philippi, you are my joy and you are my crown. Well, remember Paul alludes to that athlete quite often in the book of Ephesians. So what Paul has in mind is that he, like that athlete, when he crosses the finish line of this race in this life and runs into the outstretched arms of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and he hears these words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter now into my rest. Christ is going to take the crown of the Philippian believers and set it onto Paul's head. He will wear them like a crown. Now, of course, we know from other parts of Scripture and especially in the book of Revelation, that Paul and every other believer in Christ, even if you've been gifted with the gift of evangelism, and you lead uh, many to Christ, and you disciple them into being a faithful, committed Christian, they are your crown, they are your joy, but you will take that crown, and you will set it back at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Why? Because you and every other believer in Christ know this truth. If it were not for Christ in your life, empowering you, equipping you, enabling you to go about His work in His name, from His word, you would fail. And so whatever fruit has been yielded, it actually belongs to Christ. And so does the crown. So whilst Christ gives us the crown, we will put it back at his feet. You say, that's incredible. Yes, it is. But just for a moment, think with me practically. How does that work for you and I today? Husbands and wives, here's my exhortation to you. You living with an unsaved spouse? You living with a spouse that's not faithful? Don't grow weary in ministering to one another for Christ and the cause of Christ. Because perhaps one day, they may well be the crown that is placed on your head. Moms and dads, perhaps your children are your crown, which, your, which the Lord Jesus Christ will lay on your head that day because of your faithful service to Him in raising up the children He has blessed your marriage with. 
in the nurture and admonition of himself. And let me quickly add this. Perhaps you are even like me and some of your children have grown to their adult years and they know not the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Do not cease in being committed to Christ in being the Word of God in their lives. Folks, the list is endless. You work it out. All that I'm asking is that we would see from this very moment onwards a firmness in commitment is to recognize wherever our Lord sets us down, amongst whomsoever our Lord sets us down, with whomsoever the Lord brings into our lives, these people may well be intended by Christ to be your joy and your crown and the Lord is desiring one day to set the crown on your head when he says, well done, good and faithful servant, enter now into my rest. And like I said, you will take it off and you'll say, oh Lord, this is yours. This is all of you, not of me. Can I just say, it's for this very reason, a firmness in commitment, that Paul never got tired of people even when they were angry at him. The Corinthian believers, they despised Paul at one time. And there was a sect of them that literally were demeaning him and accusing him of all manner of ill and unrighteousness. And he loved them. Paul never got tired of people because he remembered. They may well be the joy, the crown that God is desiring to set on your head. But not only is a Christian who daily presses on for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus to be sacrificially committed to the people whom God has set into his life, her life, or whom God has set them amongst, they are to be standing firm in God's word. Look at Philippians 4 verse 1. In this way, stand firm. Stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. We are to recognize, folks, that as Christians, we are new creatures of Christ. And we are members of the church of Christ. And therefore, we are unique. And there ought to be a firmness in our commitment to the Lord. We should not be living like the people of the world. Remember, the world is proud. The believer in Christ is humble. The world is fragmented. The believers in Christ are united. The world is, uh, is impotent. It has no strength. We are gifted. The world is hateful. We are full to overflowing with love. The world does not know truth. We know truth. We are to start seeing ourselves as a committed firmness and commitment to the Lord. That first essential habit of a committed Christian, we are to see ourselves as that ship at anchor in the harbor of Christ his word. And we are not to be, as Paul goes on a little bit later in the book of Ephesians to tell everyone, like children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, every trickery of man, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Oh, I agree. There are many things, there are many distractions that are competing for our attention, that are competing for our affection. But the Christian who is pressing on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, oh, that, per that person is committed to Christ by being committed to the people he or she has been set amongst. That's the first 
essential habit of a committed Christian. A firmness in commitment. There's a second I want to point out to us. It's found in verses 2 and 3 of Philippians chapter 4. It's a peacefulness in relationships. Paul is writing and he says here in Philippians chapter 4 verse 2, I urge, I implore, I plead with Euodia and I urge, I, I, I beg and I implore Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. And then he goes on in verse 3, Indeed, true companion, if you are really in Christ with me, committed to Christ as I am committed, I ask you, help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Here's what this means, folks. If we are to understand what Paul means here, I need you to imagine with me just for a moment. Imagine for me the scene that unfolds in the church at Philippi when, he, when Epaphroditus arrives back in the city from his time with the Apostle Paul who's incarcerated in Rome. Word would have spread. The church would have been gathered. There'll be an excitement. Epaphroditus, their much-loved under-shepherd, is back in their midst. And he's, what's more, he's got a letter from Paul, the pastor who the Lord used to plant this church. They are thrilled at this news. And most likely, just as we are gathered here, they couldn't wait to hear the contents of God's inspired letter to them. What we have is our Bible. There is an excitement. There's an expectation. But there's a little awkwardness as well. Because Euodia is sitting on this side of the sanctuary in her room with her little clique. And on the other side of the room is Syntyche with her little clique. Now, I'm not sure who is doing the public reading. <laughs> But I am sure whoever it was swallowed twice when he came to chapter 4. When he read the words, I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. I'm sure he swallowed twice. Now obviously, Euodia and Syntyche's spat was so public that Paul openly addresses the matter. It's beyond going one-on-one -on -one to your brother. He's beyond that. And he's not there to shame those concerned. No, he's making this very important point. If you're a committed Christian, one of your habits will be you will make it your purpose to pursue peace in whatever relationship God sets you into. Perhaps Paul had in mind the words of Jesus Christ, who, when he delivered the Beatitudes on Matthew, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. You want to be identified as a son of God? You want to be identified as a daughter of God? Then be a peacemaker. But just as this highlights the very important habit for committed Christians that they are to pursue in their relationships, there's also a warning here. And the warning is this. Let me ask you, do you think Euodia and Syntyche were new believers in Christ when they were in the midst of their spat? Hardly. In fact, from the text, it is probable that they were one of the first believers who alongside Lydia, the seller of purple, who trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ when Paul testified of Christ at their Jewish prayer meeting by the river. And so here's the warning. 
The warning is this. Even the most mature Christian can easily fall prey to the fleshly pride and fall into petty conflict. The Christian who is pressing on for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, he or she has a daily habit of, firstly, a firmness in commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and to whomsoever he's been pleased to set you down amongst. But they also have another habit. It is to pursue peace in all their relationships. Let me take us to a third habit. A third habit for the committed Christian. It's found in verse 4. It's a joyfulness in Christ. We know Philippians 4 very, very well. Philippians 4.4 4 rather. Philippians 4.4 4 reads this way. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Now, you might find this interesting, but Paul mentions the word joy 18 times in his letter to the Philippian church. So yes, you could certainly see it as a theme running through the book. But actually, this particular verse, in the context of what Paul is saying, remember he's saying, you want to follow Christ? Follow me. Don't be apathetic in it. Follow me as I follow Christ. Philippians chapter 3. And here's how you do it. You have a firmness and commitment to Jesus Christ and to those whom he set you amongst. You have a firmness in a habit of pursuing peace in whatsoever relationship God sets you into. And you have an absolute commitment to a joy in Christ because that's what this is. Paul mentions this word joy 18 times, and I'd like to see us take this as an idea. It's an attitude that ought to be in every Christian, joy. What is significant, though, is when Paul lists a joyfulness in Christ as being the third habit of a committed Christian, there are two things that leap out as being characteristic of the joyfulness that we are to have in Christ. Firstly, look at verse 4 of Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. That word gives us a clue. That's the first characteristic of the joyfulness we are to have in Christ. It is to be continual always. It is to be ongoing. It's never to cease. And then secondly, look at verse 4 again. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. And secondly, the joyfulness that we are to have in Christ is never to be from the implication that Paul says rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. It's never going to be conditioned on your circumstance. But folks, if you're going to be obsessed with setting your joy on people, if you're going to be obsessed with setting your joy on your bank balance, if you're going to be obsessed with setting your joy on your work situation, if you're going to be obsessed on setting your joy on your relationships, that puts you on a slippery slope. Because people and circumstance, even if it's not intended, they will rob you of your joy. And therefore, your joy is to be set on Christ. When your joy is set on Christ, when you comprehend the joy that has been given you by God, and it's in the forgiveness of your sin, because remember, you and I can't raise up our own joy. Our joy is recalling to mind the joy given us in God's promise. You have come to me by faith believing. You have called upon me as your Savior. You have confessed, forsaken, and repented of your sin. You are my child. You are my treasure. You are my son. You are my daughter in whom I remember your sin 
no more, and upon whose heart I will write my law. That's the joy we have. That even if I have a zero bank balance, my sins are forgiven. And even though I get retrenched from work, whatever man can do his worst to me, I will have a joy. Because my joy is complete in knowing I am forgiven my sin by the gracious and unfathomable mercy of God and the work that He has done and is doing and will yet do to cleanse me, to cleanse every believer in Christ from unrighteousness. And so therefore our joy is to be set on Christ. When your joy is set on Christ, your joy will be overwhelming. Why? Because that's where your joy is established in the truth that your sins are paid for by Jesus Christ. And as Romans 8, 1 declares, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. But I don't want to leave it there. I'd love to share with you something from one of my favorite preachers of old. He said when he wrote in his commentary on the book of Philippians, Martin Lloyd-Jones, that diminutive preacher from Wales in the early mid-20th century, now at home in the Lord, he made this comment on Philippians 4.4 and he said, and I quote, the problem with our having a lack of joy is that we spend far too much time listening to ourselves and not speaking to ourselves, end quote. Let me read that again. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, and I quote, The problem with our having a lack of joy is that we spend far too much time listening to to ourselves and not speaking to ourselves. Thankfully, Martin Lloyd-Jones goes on to explain why he says what he says. And his observation is profound. Let me explain. When you and I wake up every morning, first thing, the first ver voice that we hear is ourselves. And if you're anything like me, it's reminding you of just how much you failed the Lord yesterday. And if you're anything like me, you're reminding yourself of what calamities are probably going to unfold in your life today. And you're bemoaning that. Martin Lloyd-Jones implores the believer in Christ, as I do unashamedly, we need to be like King David of Israel. Instead of listening to ourselves, we've got to learn to speak to ourselves. Keep your finger here. We have to see this. Come with me to Psalm 42, verse 5. Psalm 42, verse 5. David writes here, and he says in Psalm 42, verse 5, why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? He's, he's listening to himself here. And he's rebuking himself now. Because look what he says in the second part of verse 5. My soul, hope in God, for I shall praise him for the help of his presence. Now look down at verse 11. Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? And why have you become disturbed within me? Second part of verse 11, David rebukes himself. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. The help of my countenance, the smile that comes on my face, the, the joy that's overwhelming, the help of my countenance is and my God. So, Come back with me to Philippians 4. When your circumstances, when my circumstances threaten to overwhelm us, when they threaten to distract you and I into despair, 
When you find yourself speaking to yourself, oh, woe is me, who will deliver me? Where's my help going to come from? Instead of listening to yourself, start beginning to teach yourself about Christ and his promises to you. Can I just add this one thought about depression? I deal with it a lot as a biblical counselor. Depression is not something you are. Depression is something you become, and are you ready for this? It's something that you deliberately maintain yourself in. And the antidote to fixing your mind and your thoughts on Christ Jesus, to fixing your mind on His abiding presence, His abiding love, and His Word, that's where it is. You anchor your thoughts on the promises of God. When you remind yourself, when I remind myself, and we begin to speak to ourselves about Jesus Christ and His promises instead of listening to ourselves, oh, woe is me, I'm undone, you will begin to bring about that third daily habit of being a committed Christian. And so, a Christian who is pressing on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus is a firm, is a, is, is a Christian who is firmly committed to Jesus Christ and His Word, is peaceful in all relationships, is joyful in Christ. There's one more, our fourth for tonight. Please look with me at verse 5, if you haven't got back to me in Philipp with me in Philippians chapter 4, verse 5. But just look with me at the first part of verse 5. Because here's the fourth essential habit of of a committed Christian, a gentleness of spirit. Philippians 4, 5, just the first part. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Now, perhaps your version doesn't have the word spirit. Perhaps it just says, let your gentleness be known to all men. Well, the translators haven't inserted anything. They just have put it into italics to give us the context. And this isn't God the Holy Spirit. This is your inner being. Let your gentle inner being be known to all men. And so can I state the obvious? Christians are never to be self-promoting. Jesus taught that. Again, on the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter four, 5, and in verse 14 through verse 16, he says to those gathered around him, If you're my disciple, you are the light in the, of the world. A city sit on, set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp, put it under a basket, but instead they put it on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. So in that same way, just as you can see a city because it's on the top of the hill for everyone to see, just as you don't put a light under your bed, you put it on a lampstand, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works, walking with the Lord, working for the Lord, loving the Lord, loving your neighbor as yourself, and they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. This means, folks, you and I are to always consider, what will my words billboard? What will my actions billboard? Practically speaking, will my driving to church, away from church, on Monday morning, Tuesday coming home from work? Will my driving be a billboard of my impatience and anger? Or will it be a billboard of gentleness? And remember, folks, the biblical definition of gentleness, strength under control. Ask yourself, will my reaction to standing in a government department cure for the 35th consecutive hour billboard my impatience and my anger or my gentleness? Will my reaction 
to my child spilling their cereal bowl and all of its contents onto the new lounge carpet? Will that billboard my anger, my impatience, or will it billboard my gentleness, strength under control? Rebuke the child by all means, but do it with that kindness and that firmness of Christ. Gentleness in the biblical definition is always strength under control. Now, as I said, maybe the word spirit wasn't in your translations as I read the New American Standard Bible of Philippians 4 verse 5. Well, that would be correct, as I said. But to help us with the context, because you and I, here it is. Without us being yielded to the Lordship and the control of God the Holy Spirit in our lives, controlling our inner being, controlling the seat of our heart, of our affections, we'll ne never be able to produce one single ounce of gentleness. In fact, the fruit of God the Holy Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, that won't be there. But it's God's very presence in our lives that bears the fruit that we are in subjection to the Lordship He is in our lives and we'll be found in loving obedience to His Word. So for the Christian, pressing on for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, the habit of manifesting the gentleness of spirit in word, in action, oh, that ought to be there every single day. Along with a firmness in commitment to the Lord and to the relationships that he has set us into and amongst, along with a peace in every relationship that God has been pleased to set us into or to bring to our lives, and it will also be a joyfulness in Christ. There's another that we will close with tonight. It's our fifth. Our fifth habit of a committed Christian. It's the last part of verse 5. It's really simple if you haven't worked it out. It's an awareness of God's presence. Philippians 4 verse 5, let your gentle spirit be surrendered to all men and let that be known to all men as they see your gentleness strength under control. And here it is, an awareness of God's presence is an essential habit of every committed Christian. The Lord is near. Every day, and every moment, the believer in Christ is to live always being very much aware of the nearness of God. Now the word near in the Greek, it can be near in time, in other words in the next minute, or it can be near in physical space. I would suggest that Paul is intending the meaning of near in physical space. Because the other three times that he uses this very same Greek phrase is always in the context of God being near in time, uh, sorry, in space, physical space. But even if you want to hold to, well, no, this is near in time, uh, I believe Jesus Christ is imminent in his return, so I'm not going to fight you on it. But in a practical day-to-day -day living, I want to put to us, God is not distant. He is near. Think about it. Since the dawn of time as we know it, God has always been near. He's been physically close. In Genesis, we find him walking with Adam and woman. In the book of Deuteronomy, we find him near the nation of Israel. In the time of of Abraham's posterity through Isaac, Jacob, and into the lives of David and Solomon and others, we find that God is near. But let me dwell on this today for you and I, living in the day that we do. That God is near to us, physically close to us, has to be 
one of the most precious truths that you would be encouraged with in your walk with the Lord. Come with me to Psalm 73. I know I'm asking you to jump back into the Psalms again, but if you've got the patience with me, please come with me to Psalm 73. I just want to point out two verses to us of Psalm 73. Firstly, I want us to go to verse 23. God is assuring the psalmist, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You, Lord, have taken hold of my right hand, says the psalmist. Psalm 73, verse 23. Now cast your eye down to verse 28. The psalmist is extolling that wonderful truth that God is not distant, he's near. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge. For what purpose? That I may tell all of your works. He fears nothing about man anymore because God is near to him. So with a boldness, he goes forth. But look at what he says. The nearness of God is my good. Folks, your and my good, if I could put it in inverted commas, it isn't how far we live from work. Your and my good isn't whether we get a parking right at the entrance to the shopping mall. Your and my good isn't whether we get front row seats at the test match between the Springboks and the All Blacks. Your and my good is that God is near, that He is close. Why? Because He is near, He can lead, He can protect. You're still in Psalm 23. Flick back to Psalm 68, verse 19. Blessed be the Lord, says the psalmist, who daily bears our burden, the God who is our salvation. You see, folks, if God were afar off, He couldn't do this. But He is close. And He's so close that He's able to take your and my burden upon Himself. Come all the way back with me to the beginning of Psalms. Look at Psalm 3. Verses 1 through 3. David, is, ex is ex he's beside himself. He says, O oh Lord, how my adversaries have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no deliverance for him in God. But look at verse 3 of Psalm 3. But you, O oh Lord, are a shield about me. My glory, and look at this. And the one who lifts my head. This is one of the best images that God gives of himself in the scriptures. He is that shield all around us. Yeah, if you know me a little bit now, you, lo you know that I'm really not enamored with, but I'm very interested in anything military. And one of the, one of the, equipments of of the military that is really astounding to me is the m1 abraham battle tank it's remarkable but here's the thing the occupants that are seated inside they are all round shielded that's the exact image you're in christ you are all round shielded but when he says when the psalmist says he's the one god is the one who lifts my head just think with me if god weren't near he couldn't lift my head little wonder that isaiah knew this truth and whilst he even penned this before the psalms uh, Sorry, whilst he penned this, maybe not with Psalm 3 in mind, Isaiah goes on to say this in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. Like a shepherd, he, the Lord, will tend his flocks. In his arms, he will gather the lambs. He'll carry them in his bosom. And look at this. 
He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Isaiah 40, verse 11. Those lambs that are newborn, still too wobbly on their feet, to run from the ravaging wolves that are hunting the flock, the great shepherd takes them up in his arms. The nursing moms who are committed to the well-being of their lambs, God gently leads them to safety. I love that picture because I know of the children that God has blessed all the marriages with in our church family. And I'm so thankful. You can't be with your child 24-7. But God is. And the nursing moms who lovingly nurture their child at 2 a.m., cleaning up the vomit, cleaning up the bad nappy and whatever. Oh, God promises he'll lead you as a nursing mom safely to, to his refuge. But now I have to say this, because whilst it is a great blessing that the truth is God is near to the believer in Christ, I have to say this, for someone who is not a Christian, the nearness of God, the nearness of God's physical presence is both not good and thankfully good. But it's not good because the most dangerous thing to an unrepentant sinner is God himself. Psalm 7, 11 through 13. God is a righteous God. God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God, he will sharpen his sword. He, God, has bent his bow and made it ready. He, God, has also prepared for himself deadly weapons. He, God, makes his arrows fiery shafts. For the unrepentant sinner, God is close enough to run you through with his sword. He is close enough that he will not miss when he sets loose his arrow of judgment and condemnation. But then because God is who he is, the closeness of God to the sinner is also good. Because... God is close enough to hear the whispered prayer of a repentant, contrite heart as that sinner pleads for the salvation of God to be given them. God is close enough to hear that whispered prayer of a cry for mercy. Sinners want God afar off, but it's good that he isn't. So let me conclude now in your being a Christian in your pressing on for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus in your setting into your life this whole issue of marriage family children finances how to live for the Lord in your being a Christian pressing on for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus for all in your life to see most especially though for the Lord to see there should be a firm habit of commitment to the Lord, to His Word, and to the people He has set you amongst. There should be a habit of pursuing peace in all of your relationships. There should be the habit of being joyful in Christ, not listening to yourself anymore, but speaking to yourself, reminding yourself of Christ, His Word, His promises. There should be the habit of being gentle in spirit, not billboarding your impatience, your anger at people or, or circumstance around you, but instead billboarding the fruit of God the Holy Spirit. There should be the habit of living every waking moment, understanding the truth of the nearness, the physical closeness of the Lord, and that it is a great comfort. When we come back next week for part two,
We will expand the nearness of the Lord by looking at the remaining two habits of the committed Christian. Because the nearness of the Lord brings, if I could just give you a taste of what I hope to share with you, the nearness of the Lord brings a calmness in chaos. There is much, too much to say about verses 6, 7, 8 for now. And that's why I want to bring us to a close. Be committed in your walk with the Lord. Start bringing these seven habits, five of which we have looked at tonight, into your life for the glory of God and for the good of yourself, but most importantly, the others whom God has set you into. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the time given us this evening once again to open up your scriptures and to learn some wonderful practical truths of what it is that you desire of us. So, Lord, as we now go our separate ways, I ask, because of who you are, and because of your kindness, your unfathomable mercies, and because of your grace, which is sufficient for our every need, keep us safe, keep us close to yourself in word, in thought, and in action, and use us, we pray, for your glory, for your honor, exaltation, and yes, Lord, humbly we pray, Use us for the furtherance of your kingdom. Because sovereignly, yours is the power, yours is the kingdom. So I beg of you, Lord, as we go and as we go our separate ways, give to us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Lead us very quickly, Lord, into forgiving those who have trespassed against us. Deliver us from evil and deliver us from temptation. And we will give you thanks as we pray this and ask it in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.